chơi những cái trò ông luôn dùng đây cá vẫn to cái dầm nơi cá nó sẽ bị thi sạm nơi cá to tới nỉ ông dùng đây nâng sốt đập sạch đầy chấm to ra bờ mây từ bi cà phê cái đấy bẹ pon nâng ai cứ xa i bay mây từ bi cà phê cái đấy miền bắc tận về liên sơn rập chấm nôn sam sấp nền tí sầm rập cá chấm to còn té ông dùng đây số mình chạy thá cầm mây từ bi cà phê cái đấy ai bay chạy đi về liên rùm cà sấp nền tí nỉ từ Tôi mới tự vì cái việc đây mình đẹp đẹp tạm cả cú Tôi mới tự vì ai mà chạy bàn tế thà Tôi mới tự vì bài anh chạy bình lìa cầu sập nửa tì nếch dạng đuổi mà đây Tôi mới tự vì nguồn chí Tôi mới tự vì personal khi ông xe màn thà không trao cả bà hải Chỉ một phí bàm này tìm đến lâu bật thiền xâm rạp bọt tẹo hay cò bọc nhìn bạc. Bàm này tìm thiết khi nhóm đang chung từ phía kì cà phê cái đầy nằm mới để chọn bàn bạc. Bà ổ quân, cho lúc mình bị cà phê cái đầy yên xử lý. Mẹ thư vị khả nạp bạc xong chung rịp xua lâu lúc xây cháu khả nạp bạc thiền. We believe we can handle our content within the 30 minutes. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Nó bắt đầu là VTK chung từ mấy tư vi cao phía cái đây ở nôn chìa Đã bày Ở bằng hai nhằm phía sức đầy chùm tỏa Rồi bắt luôn chùm phùa ai cho xa y bày xông chơi nhỉ Thank you, Your Honor. May to be kept at the door. Good morning, Lord of the Angels. That is present here today. What I mean tonight is that we are going to be discussing the possibility of the E3 documents. But in order to do so, I will need to mention several witnesses or potential witnesses by name, and I have communicated on this topic with the Office of the Child Chamber, and I would request leave to mention the names of the witnesses. Đại thà lục trào cơm cơm bàn chưa biết sẽ làm hơi ẩm pi chung một bộ cọt để khi mà được làm một khi mà thực sâm cá này nằm thì tự làm cá một đường chuyên vận tỏ sâm ọc cồn bạn. Kerajaan Iban sedap nih, sebenarnya som ada boh. Mesti bi kapi ke daya nunci, nih Iban bi pihak sah, nih orang yang nom cekram, nih orang yang berada lebih bung, orang yang berada som yang beriap dal, nih mesti bi kapi ke daya nunci, ya thah, 
chia tu từ để chia mua xã xí đầu mình đang rót vào bên ní cứ mình ăn nhạt rồi rồi chia mua chom tê cứ việc mà miền bị chi rồi hỡi cứ rồi bảo là hai sinh niệm mình thấy đây lại cả này ní chia cả này bị xe đây mình cà phê pon từ nâng mình mình đồ lại cả xá đây mình cà phê pon từ nâng cả biển biển lại phim chênh phê pon nâng ai cả xá miền dạ thập hiệp rồi có phép ai trả tu dọc bàn để ai cái sai chuyện đó nó cứ ông kiểm đề nông cạn đây đi ai chính ai là nhà thì bị sai là xong chơi nhỉ. Thank you, Your Honor, for that clarification. Um, today we will have rather limited comments on the admissibility of documents in three categories. Um, but we feel that in order to satisfy the minimum standards of relevance, especially reliability, it needs uh, imperative that we hear a certain witness, and that witness would be uh, Mr. Yuk Chang, the director of DC. The defense is aware that another witness has been scheduled to testify on issues that relate to authenticity of the Chang documents, but it's the defense's position that it needs to be uh, Yuk Chang himself that comes in to testify, and if Mr. Yuk Chang does not come in to testify before this court, it's the defense's position that all evidence and all documents that come from DC CAM must not be admitted as evidence before this court. As you know, Mr. Yuk Cheng has managed the field work of DC CAM's mass grave family project since July 1995. He has been director of DC CAM since 1997. He simply is the most informed person when it comes to DC CAM and its activities, and especially its efforts to collect evidence. Mr. Yuk Cheng has stated on multiple occasions that only he has authenticated the documents that arrived at DC CAM and he, again, did so personally. In document B, 150 on page 3, he states, when documents come in, I inspect them personally. And in document B, 204, slash 2, he states on page 3, um, what question did you ask the people that donated the documents? And the answer is, I personally asked the questions without making any written records. As Mr. Yung Chang has stated, I have seen and handled all of the documents in the DC CAM archives and have an intimate knowledge of them. Again, this is the reason to interview only Mr. Yung Chang and not anyone else involved with it. DC CAM, or those people could be uh, questioned as witnesses as well, but Yuk Cheng himself must appear before this court. Because of his intensive personal and long-running involvement with the collection of evidence, Yuk Cheng's testimony is crucial when he was considering the issue of authenticity and reliability, and, and, and therefore of admissibility of evidence before this chamber. The defense needs to be allowed to cross-examine Yuk Chang as to his methodology, his, str his strategy in the collection of evidence, and we need to be allowed to ask him about any training he may have had in authentication. Also, for example, we need to be able to ask him what his, what his approach has been to not collecting or accepting certain evidence. It is true that uh, Mr. Yuk Chang has been interviewed several times already, both by the OCP and the OCIJ, but the defense has never been able to question this important witness, and it is a defense right to question an important, uh, a witness that's important, like Yuk Chang. Moreover, in those statements with the OCP and the investigating judges, uh, rather than providing a full clarification of his approach toward collecting information, those statements have raised additional evidentiary issues the defense needs to be allowed to further explore those issues in open court when questioning Yuk Chang. And time does not allow me to go into detail as to what issues have been raised by those statements by Yuk Chang, and I would like to slow down so I will 
questioning or my um, uh, my speech. But one issue that has come up uh, in the question of uh, Yu Chang and the D204 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 I would like to clarify uh, that the small uh, annotations on some uh, of the tool slang documents were not written by Khmer Rouge. They were written by the tool slang staff to confirm or make a note on photographs. Question, are there any notes indicating which annotations were written by Khmer Rouge in the tool slang staff? Answer, by Mr. Cheng, no, there are not. Question, how did you like to find out if the annotations were written by Khmer Rouge or the tool slang staff? Answer by Mr. Yuk Chang, I have read a lot, so I know the staff working at tool slang told me. It is obvious that this uh, is an incredibly important issue to the defense. Uh, as you know, for example, uh, Doik has testified that Nguyen Cheya has made certain annotations on certain tool slang confessions. And here we have Mr. Yuk Chang explaining that it has not only been the Khmer Rouge that has been writing on these documents. There have also been tool slang staffers, and I understand it to mean people that have worked at the tool slang museum after uh, the Vietnamese um, took over the tool slang um, compound. Also, people after the Khmer Rouge era have written on those confessions. It is evident that considering that Yung Cheng has intimate knowledge of these proceedings, it is imperative that the defense gets to question Mr. Yung Cheng on these documents. Um, it's also important to note that Mr. Yu Cheng himself has already indicated that additional measures may be needed to properly authenticate the DC CAM documents. In an article that uh, Mr. Yu Cheng wrote in 2005, which is titled Documenting the Crimes of Democratic Cambodia, and that is placed in the case file with number D11155.3, it is Mr. Yu Cheng himself that suggests that a handwriting analysis uh, of certain DC CAM documents uh, must be done in order to DC authenticate them. Also, it's Mr. Yuk Cheng himself that suggests that forensic testing of certain documents must be done in order to properly authenticate them. In other words, where OCP does not see the need to further authenticate documents that have come from DC CAM, it is the president of DC CAM himself that seems to hold a different opinion. And the defense should at least be allowed to question Yip Chang on these statements, which might very well undermine parts of the prosecution's case. And this article that I just mentioned provides even more reasons to hear Mr. Yuk Chang as a witness because it demonstrates that Yuk Chang is not a neutral historian that has been working with an actual goal to have our client and other UK leaders, Democratic and Chiang leaders, According to his work product, it must be presumed to be biased towards the prosecution. And we therefore need to be able to verify how Yuk Chang and the organization he leads went about its work in collecting and distributing DK documents and interviews. Let me be clear from the outset that we not, do not blame or criticize Yuk Chang for his prosecutorial approach as such. Of course, Mr. Yuk Chang is entitled to encourage the prosecution of the DK leaders if he so desires. But it does mean that his work product and therefore DC Kham's work should be considered with a very critical eye. And DC Kham's work can certainly not be awarded a presumption of reliability simply because DC Kham claims to be a neutral historical research enterprise. It is not. And I will quote a few lines from, from, from this article to underline this, this issue and to, to demonstrate the prosecutorial approach that, that Mr. Yu Chang has taken. This article was written before this court was established. 
ហើយនៅក្នុងអ្នកបាននិយាយមកដល់ហើយលឹងខ្ញុំជាជាប្រធានអត់ទីកាទីរបស់ that I mean, the author means that Nunchia, that he exercised the highest level of command authority during the DK regime, this de facto and possibly de jure authority extended to almost every subordinate member of the CPK ranks. The article then speaks of powerful evidence that the top CPK leaders possess the requisite mens rea for torture and states that, and I quote, proof against Nunchia is particularly strong. Again, we do not criticize Yuk Chang for this prosecutorial approach, but it must be considered for what it is, it is a prosecutorial approach. Yuk Chang is not a neutral observer in search for the truth. He is a partisan researcher that has been working with the goal of having, among others, Nguyen Chia prosecuted. And this means that there must exist a presumption of bias when considering the work of DC camp. Uh, Accordingly, and I am coming to the end, Mr. Yuk Cheng must be heard in order to properly establish the chain of custody of the documents that come from DC Khan, as well as their authenticity and reliability. I mentioned that Yuk Cheng would also be in a position to provide more information about the other custodians, about the other custodians who have been in possession of certain documents over the years. So when Mr. Yuk Cheng comes in for questioning, all parties will be in a position to question Yuk Cheng on this important topic. And if Yuk Cheng is not hurt by your trial chamber, then our position is that all evidence stemming from DC Cam cannot be considered to be authentic and reliable, and must therefore be called inadmissible. This concludes my portion of the day. I um, give the floor to uh, my colleague, Mikko Bessel. Thank you very much. I would just uh, make, uh, uh, I would like to make some uh, short comments with regard to the documents which were discussed in court uh, last week uh, and uh, which were shown uh, uh, at a particular stage during the interrogation by the prosecution of our client. Um, we still assume that we have the right to object to the admissibility of those documents, although um, at the beginning of last week, uh, the President of this Court read out a decision which uh, seems to suggest that the documents were already admitted. We assume that we are still allowed to object to the submission of those documents. If I'm wrong, then uh, my comments and the comments made by my colleagues should be seen as uh, a challenge to the authenticity of those documents and therefore as a challenge as to the weight of the uh, uh, evidentiary weight which uh, will have to be attributed eventually to those documents. Um, we object especially, and you will not be surprised to hear so, the admission of the copies, the alleged copies of the revolutionary flags which were presented or shown by the prosecution to our client. And I remember also a copy of uh, the revolutionary news, an alleged copy of that magazine which was presented to our client, and the notes taken by Ken Moon. <coughs> 
I'm not sure uh, I'm pronouncing the name correctly. I followed uh, the advice given by the President uh, and I'm unable to pronounce the name correctly. But this person, the person my client referred to as uh, the Hoon Sen's spy number nine. Who had a chit chat with my client after 1979 and took some notes, made some notes following that chit chat? My client challenged the authenticity of those documents presented to him and therefore also the reliability of those documents. The reliability mentioned in Rule 87 Section as a necessary condition for the admission. And he also gave reasons for this challenge. He said, uh, among other things, that the revolutionary flags he remembers uh, were handwritten and not typed. He said they were printed in red, not in black. And he also said, very importantly, uh, that the revolutionary flag was replaced by another magazine called The Revolutionary uh, 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 The Red Flag. Okay, how the revolutionary flag, but the Red Flag. Which replaced the revolutionary flag after 1975. Uh, and he also mentioned the special format of the revolutionary flag. He said it was published in booklet. And it did not look like the documents presented to him in court last week. And uh, with regard to the interview, and sent by number nine, and he said that he challenged the authenticity because this person could not be trusted to give an accurate statement of the interview they had together. This person was a spy. My client did not know that at the time. He learned so later, and therefore this person has a different agenda and cannot be trusted to have given an accurate account of what was discussed during this chit-chat. These documents are important, not only because the prosecutor has presented them to our clients, but they are also important. We maintain, as they give evidence, they were asked to do so as to the role of the accused of our client, the role of our client played in the period relevant for this mini-trial, the 1975 period. He is accused of having co-authored the revolutionary flag, and not so at least, he is accused of having contributed to the formation of the policies mentioned in those documents. This is evidence that goes directly to the role played by our client in the facts mentioned in the mini-indictment. And for that reason, we maintain that the threshold for admission of those documents should be high and not low, lower than we argued this morning. A lower threshold can be applied to those documents which are only relevant to the context of the facts. Our client alleges that he committed. So for these reasons, I support the request made by my colleague Yucheng, director of DC Chem, to authenticate to establish the reliability of the documents presented to my client. I understand all revolutionary facts presented to my client admitted in court came from DC Chem and therefore must have been seen, evaluated and maybe also authenticated by Yu Cheng. In addition to that, we think it is absolutely necessary to also hear Ken Nung, who sends by number nine, to be questioned on those notes. We think that those notes cannot be admitted. 
អ្នកស្រុកនៅតែចារកម្មរូបនេះក្នុងហេតុនោះទេដល់រដ្ឋសាស្ត្រតែចារកម្មរូបនេះ <coughs> Good afternoon again, Mr. President, Your Honors, and to everyone in and around the courtroom. Uh, let me begin by first uh, supporting the request made by the Moon Chair team that uh, Yuk Chang uh, come here and give evidence. <coughs> I guess you could say that he's the closest thing to a custodian of the documents that have come from DC camp. And based on the admissions that he has made, uh, he is the best evidence, we would say. Uh, he can provide certain answers, and he shouldn't be sending someone in his stead. Now, if the other person wishes to come as well, that's fine, but I, we believe that the best evidence can only come from Yuk Chang himself. In fact, let me depart a little bit and say that I, for one, am rather uh, dismayed why the prosecution, who so heavily relied on DC CAM material and has been reliant upon DC CAM to do some of its legwork, or has relied on the legwork done by DC CAM and has accepted DC CAM documents. Why? They did not, in preparation for their uh, their case. Why they did not get sufficient evidence from Mr. Yu Chang? In other words, why they didn't lay a foundation? from Mr. Yu Chang with respect to what DC CAM does, how it collects evidence, where the evidence came from, how it has been stored, who analyzes and synthesizes, where statements are made, what is the game plan, if any, are there any modalities in place to ensure that a true, accurate, and complete statement is taken in an objective manner as opposed to leading whether statements are memorialized properly or being tape recorded. Thus, in the event the individual providing the statement is unavailable at the very minimum, we have an accurate uh, recording of the statement itself and so on and so forth. Had the prosecution done this, and had the OCIJ done this, and we dare say they have not, though they were requested to do so, uh, perhaps we would be in a better position. Be that as it may, now that we are here, because there are going to be recurring problems with respect to documents coming exclusively from DC camp, the best is uh, to have a comprehensive hearing where at least we are able to glean from the custodian himself how the documents were actually collected from where, how, how they have been stored. And perhaps after listening to Mr. Yu Chang, all of us will have a certain degree of confidence that the documents are what they purport to be and are reliable enough to be used uh, Having said that, Your Honors, as you well know, last, I believe it was last week or two weeks ago, we filed, it might have been right before we came back, we filed a comprehensive 
uh, objection by way of annex to some 4,000 or 5,000 documents. They were, they were categorized according to the categories of the documents and we provided detailed explanations as to all of the documents that are in within the first phase of the trial. Uh, be that as it may, uh, briefly I want to touch upon some of these categories. Uh, first, media and public statements. And this will also include such as the, the, the famous or infamous uh, black paper and Phibis reports. The Phibis reports, you may recall, Your Honors, I, I objected to last week uh, when a characterization was being made as to what was in the report and how comprehensive it was, it was I believe, a, a, a speech by Paul Pot that purportedly was the entire speech uh, accurately uh, in their particular report. It bears recalling that FIBIS is the work product of the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, which played a vital role during the, uh, the temporal period uh, well, before 75, 79. Uh, not just here, but also in, in, uh, in Vietnam. And I, I know I don't want to turn this into a political trial, but uh, it is well aware that President Nixon, along with Mr. Kissinger, were lying to Congress and the American people when they were saying nothing was happening in Cambodia, uh, that there were no bombings, that they weren't inside. And we know from Operation Menu that that's, you know, that's certainly it's false. The CIA was heavily involved, not only here in Vietnam, but also Laos. So, without ca casting any aspersions on the agency itself, because it does provide a vital service, one has to recognize that the Central Intelligence Agency is also in the business of disinformation. And therefore, rather than just simply relying on the document because it, uh, it was generated by the Central Intelligence, uh, Intelligence Agency, uh, some indicia of its authenticity and reliability not to mention the content itself, whether it is true, accurate, and complete, is necessary. And of course, fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental rights that uh, is enjoyed by Mr. Nguyen and the others, and it's a right that perhaps I will touch upon on many of the other aspects of uh, other categories, is the right uh, to confront whoever it is that produced this document. And so he must be uh, afforded that opportunity to confront, to confront the author. And I dare say uh, the authors are known and the possibilities of us actually getting somebody from the Central Intelligence Agency to lay a foundation as to how they went about in recording uh, transcribing, producing, and what have you, these fibrous reports is, uh, is zero. Uh, now, in the, event, in the event your honors see fit that these documents may have some value nonetheless, in other words, you treat it as in the civil law system, like hearsay evidence is treated. Hearsay evidence being evidence of an out of court statement offered for the truth therein. If you, re if you, tr uh, if you treat it as such, obviously we would ask your honors to be very mindful that it has to, you have to have independent indicia of reliability of the content itself. And so if there is other, other evidence that is being presented by the prosecution or others that would validate the substance of the FIBIS report, then we would say, it being hearsay evidence, you could decide what if uh, any anyway way you would give to it. Keeping in mind, of course, the principle of the Book and articles.
this is another one of those broad categories with, that we fundamentally object to. To have someone who simply came here, to, to have a book simply admitted without the author actually coming and explaining the research, the methodology, without us probing the actual experience of uh, the author and testing the, the content of the book again violates our client's right to confrontation. And we would say that in order to fully ascertain the truth pursuant to Rule 84, Mr. Inkshree must be afforded his absolute right to confront uh, the witness. So simply introducing a book or an article, even if that author is someone of notoriety, Someone that perhaps, upon looking at the name, you would say, yes, I, uh, we could say he's a credible person. That in and of itself is insufficient. The author would need to come in. And again, because uh, I want to be balanced in my remarks and not say don't include anything, if you treat it again, you think of it as hearsay evidence. Uh, you have to be very careful to see whether the substance of the book or the article can be independently uh, substantiated to independent indicia of others. That's not, to say, that's not to say that if something is in three or four different books, that we automatically give way to it. Because we need to look at who originated the thought? What was the substance? How did they rely on How did they come up with the, the particular point? And is there any evidence that would give it support? Because it is not uncommon, and we can probably, we'll probably see this during the trial, that you have something being mentioned over and over and over again in the books. When the first author got it wrong in the first place, and it's just merely being repeated. With, with no attribution as to where the original source was, and keeping in mind that inherently authors are subjective. The third category are CPK publications and directives, and this would include the revolutionary flag. Again, we object to the admission of, this, of these sorts of publications, the flag, the directives, unless we qualify this. So we're not, it's not a blanket objection. Unless the prosecution can sufficiently demonstrate the authenticity, reliability, and relevance to each document by demonstrating who is responsible for the content of the document. We submit that we are not asking the impossible. But what we are asking is the minimum. Simply because something uh, has a logo on it doesn't necessarily mean that it is authentic. We also submit that the substance itself should not be accepted without some probing as to whether the individual writing that substance actually was in a position of knowing what exactly was being put into that document. To simply say, well, this is what the revolutionary flag says without laying a foundation as to how it was drafted, by whom, who would have been responsible for it, is not enough. So we're asking for some minimum uh, threshold test to be put to the, these sorts of evidence. Now, in the event the CPK publications and directives are admitted, and if we are not afforded the opportunity to confront the author of those documents, then we would submit that you give it a little weight, a little weight unless the content of the document can be fair, verified or supported through independent indicia. I want to be very clear on, on our position because uh, 
there seems to be some concern from at least that part of the, the courtroom that we're here to exclude all of the evidence and obstruct the process. What we're merely saying is there needs to be some, uh, some guidelines in place and in the event such evidence does come in that you have to be terribly careful in deciding how much weight, if anything, to give to it. Min, uh, uh, meeting minutes, CPK meeting minutes, we object to, just as we object to the other sorts of documents, unless the prosecution can sufficiently demonstrate the authenticity, reliability, and relevance of, each of these documents by demonstrating who is responsible for the content of the documents. We understand it is once the, these documents come in are admitted, then it is up to us to demonstrate to the trial chamber if that is our position, that is to, to show that they're unreliable, uh, for us to, to question the content of it. But if, for instance, we are not afforded the opportunity to confront whoever it is who produced it, then obviously, how is it possible to confront the content? Were the minutes written contemporaneous to the meetings? Were they written thereafter? Who was actually present? What were the actual uh, what was the actual content of the conversations or discussions taking place? Of course, the prosecution is not going to be in a position to produce witnesses to answer all of those questions. But they should be able to produce some witnesses at some point. And we would submit the earlier better, keeping in mind that your honors are, in effect, deciding the order of the witnesses, but the prosecution should be at least urging the trial chamber to hear certain witnesses that would lay a foundation. And this is, I believe, the problem, the core problem that the defense has with certain documents being used. A foundation hasn't been laid. It is no fault of the prosecution because the witnesses are coming in the order in which perhaps they had not anticipated. So, now is the time for the prosecution, however, to step up to the plate, and hopefully we will hear how they intend to lay this foundation through which witnesses. And so if, for instance, your honors do decide, uh, as, you, as you do already, provide a list of witnesses that do not necessarily provide for the laying of the foundation at this point in time, the prosecution would be able to tell all of us that certain witnesses that may appear in the future are will lay the foundation. So subject to a connection with the testimony of other witnesses, where they will be able to lay the foundation, they should be entitled to ask certain questions. And we can say with a certain degree of confidence that is the Ingsuri defense, that were this to happen, were the prosecution to list the names it be of witnesses it believes will lay the foundation. And if they were to announce at any particular point that, the that a, the, it is subject to a connection, in other words, they're showing a document, the foundation hasn't been laid, but it's, the foundation would be laid down the road. We, for one, would not be objecting to that procedure. But we would welcome uh, as soon as possible, because only the prosecution knows its case, and presumably after so many years of preparing their case, they would in fact have anticipated this problem, especially since they come from, at least the, the ones at the very top, come from an Anglo-Saxon system, so they know that this is sort of one of the, uh, the primary objections being made to documentary evidence, the lack of a foundation. And we submit that whether it's Anglo-Saxon or Roman or Germanic, 
it matters not. You still have to go through authenticity, reliability, and relevance. And you simply can't say, well, your honors, you're entitled to think about all of this at the end, freely evaluate it, and so let's throw everything in, including the kitchen sink, and then we'll figure it out at the end. It doesn't work that way. I think a certain amount of screening has to be done here, because if you're going to be putting documents to witnesses, especially an accused, the accused uh, has uh, certain rights that he's entitled to, one of which is a document that is being presented to, to the witness, at least has already been uh, demonstrated by the, to the court, and the court has already ruled upon it that it is authentic and reliable. Telegram. Again, same objection, Your Honors. In other words, this is a repeating theme uh, that I will have concerning CPK uh, material. Again, the telegrams we, we submit uh, should not be admitted unless the prosecution can sufficiently demonstrate the authenticity, reliability, and relevance to each of these documents. Presumably, when we get to uh, those uh, that area where documents of this nature will be presented, the prosecution, through a particular witness, is going to demonstrate to the trial chamber how telegrams were generated, how information flowed from the top to the bottom and from the bottom to the top. And based on that, uh, your honor will make a determination. And again, uh, in the event you admit it, and we suspect you probably will be admitting it, that when it comes to the weight, you consider uh, certain factors, as I've indicated uh, earlier. To save time, I won't repeat myself. Suspect statements. I'm pausing a little bit because I want it to sink in. It, one would have the impression that all of these suspects gave statements. And perhaps it's because of my own training, when I think of statement, I'm thinking of something that was given to an investigator. And so what is coined as a statement may be a remark that was made or picked up in the press or it may be some sort of an interview done by a reporter or a, uh, a journalist who then writes a, uh, a book. We would submit that this broad category be excluded as well unless the, uh, it's in accordance with Rule 87.3c, and Ms. Inksiris afforded the right to confront the author of the document. So to give you an example, if you have, for instance, Mr. Hedder, who, with Elizabeth Becker, has an interview with Mr. Inksiris, the statement before being used, Hedder and or Becker, should come in and give evidence. Prior to giving evidence, they should have, we, the defense and all the parties as well should have a, a, a copy of any recordings that were made. Because unless the statement was a verbatim statement, question and answer, question and answer, it calls into question the reliability of the statement itself. Just to give you an example, was the question that was posed leading or was it an open-ended question, tell us what happened? In one particular uh, statement, if you look at Mr. Hedder's approach, he starts by, by giving an explanation of what he believes and then requests a comment, in other words, feeding his opinion which may or may not necessarily be shared by the individual, and then asking for a comment. We submit that if we're going to have these sort of statements coming in, then the authors should be here. If something was picked up on the media, it is not a statement. Because what was left out 
In what context? Was it accurate? So simply because you have a newspaper article doesn't necessarily mean that it automatically is true, accurate, and complete. And we submit that the authors should come in and be cross-examined. This goes for quotes, quotes uh, and speeches. So anything that they claim is a, comes under the, the, the broad category of, of, uh, of statements should be excluded unless some indicia of, re of reliability, and we submit in this instance the author himself needs to come in. And we need to have certain material from the author. And if the author did not take, did not record it, fine. If they don't have the handwritten notes, that's fine. If that doesn't mean that they cannot give evidence. But it means that, it, that you, your honors, have the right after hearing from the parties, after, uh, the cross-examination of the witness, you are then in a position to determine how much weight, if any, to give to those statements that supposedly are attributed to the witness or to the accused. Because you have to factor in the ability, especially when it comes to the accused, the ability to actually confront. So if, uh, for instance, a, a journalist or a so-called historian comes in and says, X told me Y, but I have no notes, I have no recording, take me at my word, you should be able to then factor in at the end of the day, at the end of the trial, how much weight you wish to give that piece of evidence. And of course, going back to what I said earlier, if there are other independent indicia that would support someone or somehow that statement, then of course, you may give that uh, statement, unverifiable as it may be, more weight than that you would if there's nothing else there to support it other than a witness's mouth. Written records of OCIJ interviews and confrontations. Again, we submit that those cannot come in unless we have a right to actually cross-examine uh, those individuals. So simply because the OCIJ took a statement doesn't mean that it comes in automatically. Which brings me to Doik. Anything associated with Doik should not come in unless Doik himself comes in to give evidence under oath. Under oath. At this point, he's not being tried. He entered his plea of guilty after giving all of that evidence and even before that. Now he's coming in as a witness. He needs to be put under oath. He needs to realize that he's less than, can, uh, less than uh, candid, that he will be subject to, uh, to perjury. And since he is available, he's readily available, whether, whether these are statements to the OCIJ, whether there are written answers to OCIJ questions, or whether it is his testimony itself. Doik has to come in. And we would submit, Your Honor, we would submit that the best evidence is Doik's mouth. So rather than bringing in the evidence in and saying, well, do you, do you agree with this, we, we are of the position that Doik needs to come in and give a narrative. And anything that he has said in the past can be used in order to impeach, in order to impeach him, or if he is impeached or his credibility is called into question to use that material to validate his testimony in chief. But that's our position, Your Honor. Doik has to come here, and we cannot simply rely on his statements. The same thing would go with witness statements and, and uh, these OCIJ written records of witness interviews. Now, we've touched upon this before. I'll say this again, Your Honor. 
We believe that a summary that's made by the OCIJ investigators, and keeping in mind that we're not in a country like France where you have highly trained judges with highly trained judicial police that have a particular uh, modus operandi, they have modalities in place. Here we're dealing with investigators from all sorts of different jurisdictions and different approaches. And how one uh, approaches an interview versus another are two different matters. But we have seen already this far the value of actually having the transcription of the interview itself because the summary doesn't always reflect the transcription. Now I understand that we are in the civil law system but I do think that we have to be very careful not to use that as an excuse. Every time some Anglo-Saxon lawyer stands up to say, well, he just doesn't understand. We're in the civil law land. No. Think that. You have co-investigating judges summarizing what the statement is. And in fact, as I understand it, it is their summary that's controlling over the actual verbatim question, answer, question, answer that might be transcribed. Uh, you may have a transcript of it. Well, that may have been the case before we had recordings where it was necessary for the investigative judge when interviewing someone who may not be articulate to sort of put the narrative of the witness's testimony or witness's statement in some kind of a coherent fashion that more or less summarized uh, with precision the witness's statement. Uh, that's only natural. But now that we have tape recordings, that's the best evidence. Now we're not submitting that we can just simply uh, uh, bring in all of those uh, recordings on each and every occasion, but we do feel that your honors should have that available in all three languages so that no judge has an advantage or a disadvantage over the other. And we believe that rather than the summary, that more reliance be placed on, on the actual interview. But if we're not going to rely on the, on, uh, on the interview, we will certainly say the evidence is from the witness himself or herself. And if the witness is not available, but nonetheless, for whatever reason, if you feel that it is in the interest of justice, that that witness is statement come in, we would submit that the statement is the actual recording, not the summary. I believe I made this point earlier. Perhaps not all of you may agree with me, but nonetheless, that is our position. Uh, statements, biographies by witnesses who are deceased. So statements biographies by witnesses who are deceased, obviously we fundamentally object to any of, uh, of those biographies or statements coming in because we are not in a position on behalf of Mr. Inksiri to cross-examine those individuals. And I believe this issue did come up, Your Honors, in case 001, and I alluded to that earlier this morning, so I won't go into the details of that. But I won't go into the details of that. ECCC filings and records of proceedings, and by this I mean uh, written records of adversarial hearings, uh, written record of initial appearance, Request for investigative action by the parties. We submit that these categories of documents are immaterial. To suggest that because I, we, on behalf of Ms. Ingsuri, 
filed an investigative ban request, and in their request, we put in the context the under which the, the request should be made. Why is they had perhaps even had a historical uh, aspect to it? That, that in and of itself is not evidence. Is not evidence. Is not evidence. That, that is our position, and based on our position, we're making a request for investigation. To now turn around and for the prosecutor to say, "Huh, this is evidence." Keep in mind, we are at the point of the prosecutor to say, "Huh, this is evidence." Keep in mind, we're at the point of the prosecutor to say, "Huh, this is evidence." ອ່າຊື່ບັນເຄດໂດຍລາວການຫນໍຫາຍຶງມັນສະນາສົມອາດມີກິດສິດທີ່ບໍ່ໄດ້ຕ້ອງໃຫ້ຖ້າຍຶ
Your Honours, as you well know, we have filed uh, numerous submissions concerning the admissibility of evidence. Because of time limitations, obviously, I wasn't going to go into on all of them. Suffice it to say, through my comments, I incorporate by reference all of the legal and factual arguments we have made concerning the admissibility of evidence. And again, uh, we wish to thank you for uh, the time given to us to discuss these issues. Thank you very much. ลูกเสียชาวกรรมในบ้านพระดอลเปลเอาขึ้นมาสมอคุณลูกมิตรวีเป็นเรื่องดอลเปลในสมดมมงหนึ่งสมระเฮยในอังกฤษเรียกประก